I think it's terribly important to insist on individual values. Learning culture podcast. Initiative, creation, all these things which we value. It's now possible to make organizations on a larger scale than it was ever possible before. Learning culture podcast. Teach people to analyze the kind of things that are said to them. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Learning Culture Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Barry, and joining me this week is Ajay Pangaka. Ajay is an award-winning performance and cost strategist, as well as an author of three books, focused on combining his two expertises, finance and accounting, as well as training in the workplace. Their most recent book, The Trainer's Balanced Scorecard, is a jumping off point for a lot of our conversation today. And we're exploring the topic of measuring training ROI. Ajay is a professor at the Sprott School of Business and has authored and published multiple courses on LinkedIn Learning as well as eLearningIndustry.com on these very topics. So it was a real privilege to be able to pick his brain about some of them. In this conversation, you'll learn why stakeholders don't care about learning. They care about doing. You'll learn what the business actually is measuring and why when you say the ROI on training, that doesn't make sense to them. You'll also learn about Ajay's experience working for three years with Apple's customer support team back in 2005 when the business, Apple, was turning around and they identified customer support as a key indicator for success for them moving forward. The work that RJ and his team did with Apple at that point was fascinating and gives you some practical examples of things I talk about a lot on this show. Shared vision, vulnerability, continuous learning and taking ownership at the individual level. Finally, you'll learn how targeted learning interventions in real time and accessible in the moment of need are the keys to unlocking the return and the effectiveness of your efforts as an enabler of people in your organizations. I know you're going to get a lot of value out of this conversation. I definitely did. So please sit back and enjoy my conversation with Ajay Pangaka. Hey, Jay, welcome to the show. Well, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Andrew. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to dive in because you bring a a expertise and background in the topic of business, uh, finance, and accounting to a topic that is on the mind of anybody in people development, enablement, and that's measuring the ROI of training. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to yep. start right off the bat. Should people be measuring the ROI of training? Yeah, this may be your shortest podcast, but the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the short answer is no, but there's quite a longer answer to it, as you can imagine. And, that and we're going to... Th- exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, so, yeah. So just why? Why shouldn't they be doing it? Well, okay. So uh, let me pre-qualify a lot of things I'm going to say, because what when I, I'm a little controversial when it comes to this stuff, and, and, and I'm not necessarily controversial. It's just that people try to pay me to be controversial uh, when I start vocalizing my intent here. That's number one. Number mm-hmm. two, and I think uh, as my old boss used to say, um, you're basically insulting somebody's baby. Um, yeah. And and so when you are insulting somebody's baby, like tra- training ROI and all this kind of, I have choice words, but I'll be more polite here, crap <laughs> um, that yeah. goes on, it's, it's misleading people. And where I'm coming from, Again, and what they try to demonize it a little bit on my on me is that it's Ajay's perspective, and it isn't. Mm-hmm. It is. Uh, this is based in um, educational fact from accounting standards, accounting rules, financial rules uh, that all their stakeholders are formally educated in business to understand ROI. So that's where mm-hmm. I'm starting from to provide my, yeah. my argument. But the, in short, the, the shortest part because there's several reasons, but the shortest part is that um, training, and I use the word training on purpose, not learning, because stakeholders look at it as training. Um, Training is a line expense. And as a line expense, and any line expense in the business, and I'm speaking as a CPA myself, Mm -hmm. as a line expense in the business, you do not measure a return on investment of any type of expense or any type of cost center. And so as soon as you say a return on investment for a line expense, there is no measure for return on investment. Uh, 
Mm. And I equate this to things like um, marketing, for example. Marketing is a little different in recent years, but mm. prior to technology taking over, mm -hmm. marketing was an intangible, just like we are. And mm -hmm. you could not you could not really measure the ROI of marketing. You could not say that if we put in a multi-million dollar ad campaign mm -hmm. that it produced so much sales. You can't. It, there was a causal relationship, granted, yeah, but, but the there wasn't a direct relationship. Right. And so, you know, you can say, yeah, our campaign worked. Well, it could have, but it could have been other factors, you know. So mm -hmm. training is in that fa boat now, but uh, mm -hmm. like marketing, training also has the power of technology behind them to change that. And so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and yeah, that's that's an interesting point because there is there is the ability to now to measure return on ad spend and those kind of things. So we maybe come back to that point and see where where that can be applied in in the world of learning. But yep. I think first of all, you make a good a, a distinction there that between learning and training, right? And 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 to me, that's also just indicative of a perspective shift that you're getting at between who's doing the measuring, right? If it's someone whose whose responsibility is learning and enablement. The, they have a very different way of measuring the effectiveness of that versus the business that, to your point, is using an income statement to look at the expensing and, and saying those costs are not capitalized. This no. isn't an investment, right? This is um, this is yeah. an expense. So, um, so let's let's kind of just dive into that a little bit more, like from the perspective of the business that is seeing training as as a cost center, right? Versus mm -hmm. versus an investment. Um, what why? Why has it not been seen as an investment? So here's the thing. Um, let me begin by saying, as soon as you bring the word cost center into training, uh, hairs on the backs of all practitioners go up because they think they're being disparaged and insulted. And it's not the case. When your stakeholder says you're a cost center, it's a supporting what we call supporting or enabling competency within um, the within the uh, the organization mm -hmm. uh, to contribute indirectly to the the success and the profitability of the organization. And, and mm -hmm. I said indirectly is the operative word here, mm -hmm. because there's other centers in the organization. There's a profit center, uh, which is directly re expected to produce profits. There's an investment center that is a spin-off to allow companies to uh, manage their own investments within the organization to grow that company. Mm -hmm. um, and cost center is a, a label uh, of how the supporting elements of the organization supports the organization. And cost and, and and the reason I'm saying this is because, and I don't want to go down the rabbit hole of accounting and finance here, but mm. basically understanding those three concepts from a stakeholder's perspective is understanding how they evaluate each center's performance. Yeah. And their perform so going with that, um, you're still I like to say to the trainers and trainer practitioners is that. Training is a business within a business expected to deliver business results. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, it's not about training. It's not about learning. Your stakeholders, and I'll say this right to the people that are listening right now, mm -hmm. your stakeholders don't care about lear people learning. They care about people doing. Mm -hmm. And so it's not. It's it's about the outcome that they want to see. So if I'm going to put Andrew through a course, whatever in whatever method, mm -hmm. Andrew, I don't care how much he retains or is able to re retain and, and, and think about. Oops, sorry. <laughs> um, Hey, we got an additional guest here as a cat. So <laughs> yeah, I love it. I have <laughs> one as well. It may we're, pop we're, in. we're working from home, but, uh, yeah, but yeah. You know, at the end of the day, um, they want to. If I send somebody training as a stakeholder, I want people to come back to their jobs to do it better. Because if they do it better, yeah. they become more productive. They become more productive, become more profitable. Yeah. And so there's a causal relationship right there. But that's where I think there's a, a gap because when they talk about ROI, Andrew, they conflate. The return on investment because they're they're casually saying that learning or putting knowledge into people is an investment which theoretically i agree you put mm -hmm. knowledge into our heads it's it's an investment that they're making mm -hmm. but not in the as you mentioned with the critical operational words it's not capitalized um in the, the truest sense of how the your stakeholders understand it yeah. so as a cost center how do we measure that well it's through outcomes it's through performance metrics Mm -hmm. uh, and that is like I used to tell I tell people all the time. Well, how do you figure that out? Well, guess what? Your organization has a performance framework built in. It's not on our ownership as training. It's mm -hmm. an ownership of the leadership. And performance is not just people. It's a lot of operations. Mm -hmm. And so there are metrics there that they are these managers are expected to achieve. So, hey, pull out of your magic bag there. Uh, go do a needs and go to, go become a partner to the operational department. Ask them what performance pressures are under mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and say, hey, maybe we can help and, and maybe we can be investigator, be your therapist and try to help mm-hmm. your employees achieve those objectives. And there's your, if you want to call it ROI, uh, I hate yeah. to go in there, but yeah. it's your, your proof of performance um, that comes out of the investment that they make in training. Mm-hmm. You you said there were two, um, or maybe I misheard you, two measures, performance metrics, and? Uh, what did I say? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. No, maybe I, uh, maybe I misheard you. Maybe I well, misheard no, you. I mean- yeah. Sorry, so do it. at the end of the day, it, it's basically it's about performance outcomes. And so, so yeah. and we're not responsible for developing the performance outcomes. Yeah. The performance outcomes already exist. And here where I really get upset and disappointed with training, and I, I hate to say that out loud, but mm. we try to reinvent the wheel, number one. We try to invent our own metrics to prove what we're doing is right. Mm. And that's not what they want either. Mm. They want you to move their needle. They don't want yeah. to move your own needle. And that's the, the issue right now. So that's so key. Like uh, to me, and I said that at the beginning, right? It's the perspective, understanding the different perspectives. And I think that's where you knowing both worlds are helping to bridge that gap. Because as a learning professional who only knows learning and, you know, incredibly passionate, caring people out there that do that, yep. um, have have their own, like you said, like different metrics for measuring things. And there's this misconception about what what the business actually cares about and all that. And so that's that's what we we sort of unpacking today. So um, when when the business looks at the when the business looks at at the the investment, the expense, the outlay yeah. of cash, right? To yeah. to to whatever it is, whatever that initiative yeah. is for learning. Um, what are they looking at? So. I think you've, you've mentioned like just performance outcomes, like what else, like let's paint that picture yep. of like what matters to someone who's I'll writing a check. To do so. And it's an easy way to do it, Andrew. Um, and it's something that uh, all formally educated trainers or practitioners know. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we were, we we're also brainwashed with the, the Kirkpatrick methodology, right? The mm-hmm. level four levels of Kirkpatrick. Mm-hmm. And, and what I like about it, and I'm not a proponent of it. I've had the, pleasure of meeting him uh, when he was alive hmm. but what i like about it is the simplicity because what it speaks to is the one to four now but here's the deal as pra- a practitioner would practice it they work from one to four hmm. and they should be working from four to one you know so hmm. stephen covey once said we begin with the end in mind you, you don't know your journey you don't know your destination until you know where it is mm-hmm. and so level four is that destination hmm. it is what do your stakeholders want to improve like what mm. is, you know, and you can, and, and a performance framework, I speak about this in my book, the trainer's balance scorecard, but mm. um, in that framework, there's a component called learning and growth. And in that is, that's the enabling part of the, all the operations of the organization. Mm-hmm. And you'll have, you know, whatever it may be, it, it is a, it, it becomes granular because it's what we call cascaded throughout the organization. It starts from a corporate level all the way down to each of the departments and they all mm-hmm. connect with each other to the mission. Mm-hmm. And I say to them, you can follow that trail down to the department or operational level that you're going to. And those people have very key metrics, um, uh, performance metrics, both both financially and both mm-hmm. qualitatively. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, the qualitative ones are always tied to a financial outcome eventually. Mm-hmm. But all you need to do is work with the end of mind. And that's why I said at the beginning is that you need to get out of your cubicle or your office and stop because here I'm going to be going on a tangent, Andrew, just a little bit, but there's a complaint now that a lot of practitioners say, well, we're just order takers. Well, that's not the stakeholder's fault. That's your fault. I'm sorry to say it mm-hmm. because you're sitting in your cubicle waiting for them to come for you and allowing them to dictate your expertise. Like, mm-hmm. hey, come in and develop this training for us. We need a problem. But they're treating mm-hmm. symptoms, not the root cause. Yep. And you're hired as a subject expert to help them find a root cause. Mm-hmm. So my, I always say to them, get out of the cubicle and become proactive. You know, so go to that operational director and say, okay, you are under pressure to meet certain metrics. I'm not the expert here, but what are your pressures? Uh, what are the pressures that you have to face? Mm. And once they start identifying, you don't, still don't know the answer how you can help to improve, right? Mm-hmm. So they may say, let's say, I'll give you a very simple example. Let's say the uh, level four metric would be um, reduce um, production defects. Mm-hmm. Okay, there is a manufacturing line and they have to, they have a, I don't know, a 10% defect rate. And they've, they've calculated that if they reduce the defect rate by 4% or 5% in the next year or six months, mm-hmm. it will save the company X number, 100 or thousands of dollars. Mm-hmm. Okay, fine. There's a metric. Now, number one, do we fit into it? Does training fit into it? Mm-hmm. Because it may not be training, right? It might be 
a process issue that because the way things are being assembled is just out of whack or maybe a, a machinery is not working properly. Anyways, I'm diverging here, but yeah, yeah. But you have to first admit to yourself, do we have a role to play and how do you find that out? Well, guess what? We're skilled in needs assessments, right? Mm -hmm. we, we can go and do a skills assessment, needs assessment and, and be um, diagnose it, whether the employees are lacking the skills. And maybe mm -hmm. they are. And we find out that maybe there's a new piece of equipment that was brought in and the, the company was training them on it, didn't train them properly. Mm -hmm. And now we have to go back and, and identify the target areas within that piece of equipment of how to do it better. Mm. And that may result a reduction in defects. Mm -hmm. And so I'm giving you the simple example because here's the level four metric is that reduction in defects, mm. you know, percentage. Working back, okay, so level three I spoke to you is like, okay, we've diagnosed that it could be a tra uh, employee issue. Okay, mm. now level three is what do they need to do better to bring that defect down? Mm. Level three, application. Yeah. Okay, work backwards. Okay, what, do we, what knowledge do they need to know? Mm -hmm. Level two. Okay, then level one, how do we develop a solution mm. that delivers all of those elements? So mm -hmm. to me, that's, and to me, that's not rocket science. No. I, mean, I don't want to disparage learning and development, nonetheless. I know they do a lot of good work. Yeah. But if you stop focusing on the vehicle and look mm. at the, the destination first, yeah, your vehicle will be a lot better, right? So that's, yeah. that's where I I'm going yeah, I'm a big proponent of everything you've just said. And it's it's really like a call to go back to basics here to say like there's there's a process to this. I love to say the focus on end, end goal, the outcome. There's a focus on action, like doing things differently and then and then going to the knowledge. Often people just stop at sort of level two, mm -hmm. right? We just, you know. Well, you know, here's the deal. Um, we, first of all, we've going back to your point about we focus on learning too much. And don't be mm -hmm. wrong. Uh, I use this analogy. I, you know, occasionally I like to. Re I get a craving for McDonald's. I love Big Macs. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't want to give a plug for McDonald's here, but and they put the se their secret sauce on there. Mm -hmm. I will never want to know what's in that secret sauce. I mean, mm -hmm. I know videos out there, and people are going to tweet at me. Here's it. No, I don't want to know. It mm -hmm. tastes good mm -hmm. because if I if I find out how the sausage is made, I don't want to know. I mean, I yeah. probably will never eat it again. Yeah. But the point being is that nobody cares outside of learning how you build that solution. Yeah. You know, what are the learning metrics? And I don't mean, again, I don't mean to be disparaging. What I'm trying to say here, as an account, I work with finance and accounting people. Nobody mm -hmm. cares about how the accounting creates the financial statements. Mm -hmm. All the stakeholders want to see is the, the report and yep. what it means, right? Nobody yep. wants to know how the accountants make their sausage and nobody wants to know how learning makes their sausage. They just want the results and the output. And yeah. so it's not saying your, your sausage making ability is not important. That's what got you hired, yeah. but use that to achieve your destination. And that's really where, where you want to go. Yeah. And, and that's almost, a, it's freeing to think that you don't have to justify the means. You just no. have to get to the outcome, right? Which makes um, an interesting point, Andrew. I mean, uh, you know, I, we live, we are talking about technology for, and I, and I want to sort of broach this a little bit and maybe um, have a conversation with you on this, but hmm. Technology is playing an ever important role. So practitioners have been begging for more technology. Mm. Um, and that's a double-edged sword with stakeholders because they will want to give you technology. But the way we see technology and the way they see technology are two different things, especially you know when we talk about the word e-learning. To me, it's an umbrella term for all mm. learning technologies. Yeah, uh, And the e is a very distinctive letter there. Mm -hmm. that for one reason we see it one way but stakeholders see the meaning in the e differently yeah and and the word they see there is efficiency mm. not not electronic okay mm. so as soon as you see e-learning you know what goes through a stakeholder's head and you know this andrew the first thing they say is oh we don't have to send people out for training we don't have to put them in a class for eight hours we don't have to do this we're saving all this money we don't have to displace them we're, they're, they're thinking savings, right? They're seeing efficiency. If I could, and that's a big deal, right? Today, they don't want interruptions in the workflow. Yeah. And, and again, side note, they don't. They know that learning is important, but at the same time, they do not want to see a disruption in productivity. Mm. So if you say e-learning will do that, they're seeing efficiency in learning, not. Yeah. So that's. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's another great um, kind of. It helps paint that picture of, of what um, that perspective shift is and what what the, the management is looking at and what business is looking at. 
Um, to add to that, I think one of the other challenges is that there is no often no direct correlation or causation nope. between training nope. initiatives, learning programs, and and well, those outcomes. I will say uh, uh, I'll let you continue. I'll say yeah. yes with an asterisk on there. For, okay, so yeah, back, back yeah. That. <laughs> well, so yeah, I think no, that's that's basically the question. Like how how to. I mean, do you agree with that? And 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 if so, like how do you navigate the fact that there is often an indirect correlation that, that we have to deal with? So um, let's go back to my defect example uh, for a second. Even though I help the employee improve um, how they do things and they reduce the defects, and, and maybe I don't achieve the 5%, maybe I didn't. I helped the company achieve a one or two percent reduction. Mm -hmm. Even then, I still look like a hero. So let's keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. But I have to be careful here because we just said there's not a direct correlation. There may be a causation um, on that, but there's mm -hmm. not a direct correlation. Right. And they say, well, yeah, I put training. The employee did better, and the defect came down. Okay, fine. If you want to go down that path and take credit, full credit, then you're negating all the other parts of the organization mm -hmm. that are contributing to that process. So not, you're insulting them, first of all. And number two, you're not just you, you're taking credit for something that may be not totally uh, your success. Mm. And so there may be other parts of the process that um, that um, are contributing to that reduction in defects. So training mm. is one of them, but it might be other stuff. Maybe there was a process flow and then we changed that. Mm -hmm. so because if you paint yourself in a corner to success, if it doesn't go right, you can't wash your hands and say, well, mm -hmm. it wasn't training's fault. Right, exactly. Because if you paint, you want to take the full success, you got to take the full blame. Yeah. But going back to your question, so that's one thing. And mm -hmm. and you, so you can't take full and you can't full direct causation. But here's the asterisk part of my mm -hmm. agreement with you. Mm -hmm. We asked for technology. So past making learning more efficient and more effective uh, and more tangible and more direct, uh, just like marketing, they're expecting us to report on metrics. And the technology allows us to report on those metrics so, and how people learn and how to apply it, especially mm -hmm. the application side. And so while we may not still be in the, in the cozy zone where they know it's an intangible and there's no direct correlation, mm -hmm. they still want to see some evidence. Mm -hmm. And and your technology can do that. So the reason we buy LMS is for tracking purposes. And it's not just for what people took. Is it how did they use it? Like, I don't care if Andrew or Ajay just enrolled in this course and they went through it. And they, mm. I want to know, okay, how, you know, what, what did they look at in that course? Mm. How did they use this course? And I'll give you a live example. Uh, in my past, I've been privileged to have a success with Apple. And mm. back in 2005, 2006, when we started working with them, it's before the term of big data and data analytics. Mm. Um, they decided that they wanted to, Steve Jobs decided they want to be number one in customer service. Mm -hmm. And what would most companies do? They would go out, get a pre-canned customer service uh, training program mm -hmm. and train their staff, right? Mm -hmm. And hopes they, hope something sticks. Mm -hmm. But what Apple did is says, no, we're not doing that. We have to have, we have targeted metrics. We, first of all, we want people to reduce the call in. That's one of the level four metrics. Mm -hmm. We want people to have reduced cycle time when the customers call in to get in. And we, if the problems are solved, we need to make sure there's a hundred percent solution rate to all customers who call in. Mm -hmm. And so if you ever call Apple, you'll see that ha still happens. Mm -hmm. But what happens, what they did in the metrics, and I'll keep this simple, they did it backwards. They did, they did, this, uh, they did assessments with us. So we were dri to our software, we we're driving one and a half million to two million assessments per year for 8,000 employees. Mm -hmm. And what that was doing is that in the back end, they were studying the results of the assessments, the testing of the skill set, mm -hmm. and seeing where the weak areas were. Mm -hmm. And then they would say, okay, RJ is weak in connecting the iPhone to the MacBook. Okay. Uh -huh. Let's, okay. So now how do we intervene with that? So do we put, through, put it through a training course? Do we coach him? Do we mentor him? Do we put him through simulated experiences, mm -hmm. whatever it may be. And then we solved that problem, but it was an iter iterative process. They kept on testing and they kept on improving that. Mm -hmm. But you see, they were very targeted in their approach to the learning department there. And again, it's not by accident. The learning department is fully integrated with operations. Mm -hmm. It's not an afterthought. It's not like, mm -hmm. oh, we have to go to training. No, training mm -hmm. is part of it, just like at Toyota and, and other companies. Mm -hmm. So that's an example of direct correlation. Mm -hmm. uh, of making a difference um, to a certain extent using technology and the metrics. And that's what 15 years ago now. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and look at them now. I mean, so yeah. for me, like uh, the, what you just described there is saying 
it, it's getting much more granular with what what thing what, which what are the factors that are being driven here getting um, specific about what they're measuring i'm curious there were they how are they measuring that the the sort of gap between knowledge and doing like that someone was actually like i'm trying to understand what that assessment looked like well there's um in the software at the time and now a lot of the, the examination type software do a lot more but they were doing um the way they structured the testing was through a branching assessments and stuff like that so it would take people down different paths depending on how they would answer the previous question so they would get a, a feeling of where this company the, the person was going with the skill set mm. um, and they would be able, through that branching process they were able to come out of it at the end saying do the analytics saying okay you know um, bob or mary is 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 getting weaker in this area and mm. now let's dig dig digger deep here and then they would direct assessments in that area and and then in the reporting side they had a lot of um, analytic feedback from the questioning right so they would see the standard deviation for certain questions and um what were the other i'm slipping my mind now but there was other mm. metrics in there mm that were very targeted and and so as soon as they got into a very granular format they were able to go back to that employee and not just you know shove them in a customer service or a ipad or i macbook training program mm -hmm. and hope something worked they would say you know andrew we realize and this is not a reflection on you we want to improve you yeah, but we realize yeah. there's a weak area in you here and we want to make you better mm -hmm. and so here's what we're going to do with you Mm. Yeah, maybe you need a full course, so let's throw you in a full course. Or maybe, no, no, you know your stuff pretty well, but there's this one area that we need somebody to coach you on and get you to practice, mm. and, and you became better at it. And so those, it was those metrics that became very – allowed it allowed Apple, in this case, to become very precise and targeted, and that's the key, right? Mm. What did Horst Stolovich once say, you know, um, uh, what was it? What is the title of his book? Uh, I can't remember now, but <laughs> – it's the spray and pray term, right? You know that we've heard yeah. about it. You know, yeah. the trainers like to go spray and pray, right? Spray mm -hmm. and pray something sticks. And yeah. it's like, no. no. Like, the, first of all, that's unacceptable today, right? I mean, yeah. come on. With the technology tools that you're asking for, you're asking for trouble if you're going there. And if you if you get your budget cut and, and, you're look, and people are not coming to you for helping to solve the problem, that's on you. Because every every element of an organization is there for it to produce value. And if they start mm -hmm. cutting your budget, they're not seeing the value you're providing. And that's mm -hmm. on you. Yeah. And how was that uh, received at Apple at the time? Um, what was your impression of sort of the employee's impression of the learning culture? Oh, they were very... Um, they were very favorable to it in a sense in the sense that they were a little hesitant at the beginning because you know it's that um defensive posturing like employees um as soon as they feel like they're being targeted to to find their weaknesses they think mm. they're going to be fired or something yeah else. So, yeah but as soon as the culture internally at the operation center said that no 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 we, our boss, Steve Jobs, the head boss, said, mm. "We want to be number one in customer service, and we have to define what that is." Mm. And nobody in the, and they actually explained to the staff that nobody in this room is perfect. Mm. Everybody has weak areas. We need to embrace that, and we need to solve it. Mm. And and as soon as that sort of that mess, and I'm being I'm paraphrasing here, they were a little more explicit, but mm. as soon as that messaging went out, the, the leadership and the cultural aspect people were more receptive and actually at towards the end people were like i want to find more of my weak areas and become better yeah and so it showed that and it and then it showed on the metrics on the customer side that was the level four side the customer side when customers were saying wow you know uh, when i call microsoft or dell or whomever i don't get my problem solved where they blame me uh, but when i call apple and i have added apple products when i call them they fix my problem without accusing me of doing something wrong <laughs> they've yeah, actually yeah, fixed yeah. it yeah. Um, and they're not perfect. I'm not being a commercial for Apple here, um, sure. but they're heads and, heads and shoulders above a lot of other competitors. For sure. Yeah. So I, I love that that anecdote because I'm hearing a lot of the things that I write about and, and, and talk about with people that they were doing well there. There was a shared vision or a common purpose that people were working towards. There was this embracing of vulnerability and, and mistakes and, and, and t because people saw it as a continuous learning culture that we were trying to get better as an organization that shared vision in each individual. And then I think the last point that, that there was ownership taken by each individual. So every customer, like they, it sounded like they were, they were taking ownership of that person's problem to help them fix it. Right. Yeah. Like, 
incredible. Like just so perfect and example. I don't, and like I said, I don't know how they are today. Uh, I, I've, I haven't worked internally with them, but back then, remember around 2005 to 2008, they're still in their, I wouldn't say infancy, but you know, they just come at 2000. So 2000, I was there when the iPhone launched. 2007, and, uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, uh, it was 2006 to 2009 that we worked there, up to 2010. Hmm. But Apple just said, in the early 2000s was just turning around, right? Yeah. They just brought back jobs and they were about yeah. to go bankrupt. And so it was pretty recent, you know, to mm. at that point, five to six years later to do this kind of thing. So mm. of course, employees are going to be receptive and you need to get their buy-in at that point because mm. that company would be in trouble otherwise. And so, um, yeah. that, but that goes back to, again, again, I want to share that as a learning practitioner, you're not expected to be the business expert, or the financial expert. They mm. hire people for that, just like they hire people for learning. However, yeah. you need to respect the fact that you're in a business and you have to be literate about it. Yeah, um, You're not an island unto yourself. Um, and and that's, I guess that's a little bit like Mark, uh, you had Mark last off on your last podcast. Yeah. A, a bit of that mentality where, you know, that little academic sort of learning mentality that sort of it gets involved in the learning department. Yeah. And it's like, you forget you're not in a, you're, you're not a business unit. You're another supporting function. Just, yeah. and by the way, uh, by going back to the cost center question, Andrew, mm. uh, let me name a few other cost centers, production or manufacturing, mm. marketing, mm. HR, accounting and finance mm-hmm. <laughs> I, uh, mm-hmm. are cost centers. So don't think you are special. Yeah. <laughs> Call it cost centers. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love that. And I, I think it just, um, a perfect example there of um, oh, actually, and I had a question on that was uh, the uh, how was that investment or the outlay of cash viewed by Apple in this? So you, even though that the, the, all these things were, were done really well, like what what was that part of as an initiative for them? So that's a great question. So remember, let's go back to the beginning of our conversation. I said it was an expense and a line item. Yeah, I have to be careful here because training, the training activity itself. Uh, you sitting or somebody watching this podcast or, mm. um, you know, watching the learning course, mm. that activity itself is in a line expense. It's ethereal. Yeah. However, the development, so the equipment, mm-hmm. um, the strategy, the, the, the investment put behind this whole thing with Apple, mm-hmm. um, so the software, the technology, yeah. the, the time, of, and even we can capitalize certain uh, employee time in, in that package mm-hmm. because there are rules around accounting and finance to package this. Mm-hmm. That total investment to do that part yeah. would be considered a what we call a capitalized investment mm-hmm. um, or a capital a capital investment, right? Mm. And that when you, as soon as I say the terms capital investment, um, the term capital means just a long term investment into mm. the organization to to deliver indirect profitability. Just like if we bought property, um, mm. you know, equipment or whatever, the that kind of investment, and that was probably in the millions of dollars. Um, I mean, my portion was probably small in that component, mm. but mm. the overall project was probably in the millions and millions of dollars. They probably capitalized that over what they deem what well, was a lifespan of that, the duration of that output. Mm. So it might be five years, 10 years, whatever. Mm. But they capitalized it over that years, meaning that they they look at, and that's where return on investment comes from, from uh, the term return on investment. And by the way, we don't use the rinky-dink formulas that, that Training ROI speaks about. By the way, nobody recognizes those formulas in the business world because they don't mm-hmm. exist. Mm-hmm. Uh, my, none of my textbook has a training ROI formula in it. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Uh, but the real ROI formulas, and, I, and if people want to get geeky on me, I'll, I'll just do a side note here. Mm-hmm. Things like um, uh, capital budgeting calculations, like net present value or internal yeah. rates of return mm-hmm. or payback periods. Uh, all these are our true ROI calculations. Even um, cost, volume, profit, or as we know it as break-even analysis, mm-hmm. are all... Uh, um, uh, ROI calculations. Mm-hmm. However, and again, uh, so again, just put a note on the side here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't expect people to learn this. That, that right. You go to your finance and accounting department to help you with that. Right. They're the experts. But brush up on it. Learn what it's about. Mm. Uh, but at the end of the day, when they look at that capitalized investment, whatever it is, forget about Apple. Let's just say they you want to buy an LMS, and the LMS mm-hmm. is worth, I don't know, $500,000. Well, guess what? You better build a business case of an, a return on investment calculation with the finance team and the IT team about how to pitch it to the stakeholders to buy into that capital investment. Because mm. what it does, it affects the balance sheet of the organization. Mm. And all the long-term investments in the balance sheet are capitalized. And all those balance sheet investments are expected to contribute long-term value to the organization. Mm. So your business case not only has to have a financial capitalization calculation, but it has to have a qualitative 
output of what is it going to contribute in the next five or 10 years to the organization? Mm. What are you going to do with it that makes the organization stronger and better? Mm. Mm. And so that's where that ROI part comes in. Mm. But the training activity itself, that's the, the, the second part, well, not the second part, but equivalent second part is something that happens and is done. Mm. So, you know, you watch, you, you watch an instructor and they teach you something for that hour or two hours. Um, that's expensed and that's yeah. not capitalized and yeah. that's done and they hope something that you learn from there you can apply yeah. so that's the that's the thing that people need to understand on that and i'm not trying to be a hard ass here honestly to be honest with you i'm just i'm quoting from the accounting and financial standards um yeah. so don't believe me i i swear I, I swear here andrew i want people not to believe me this is not my point of view this is not my opinion this is not my methodology i have nothing to shill here mm. Ask your financial people or go break out an accounting textbook or a finance textbook or something and you'll see what I'm saying is mm. fact. Mm -hmm. Hey, it's your host, Andrew here. I wanted to take a second just to say that if you're enjoying this podcast, we would love it if you did a couple of things for us. If you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. It really allows us to grow the channel and reach a lot more people like you. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, take a moment to leave us a rating and review. It's a great way to give us some feedback and to tell the world what you think about this podcast. So whether you listen to it on YouTube or you listen to it as a podcast, if you take one of those actions, it would mean the world to me and my team. Thank you. And with that, right back to the show. I think for me, the biggest unlock there applied to learning is to think of your efforts as how can I build assets versus um, I, I, so I talk about, um, I think Curious Line is built on this fund, foundational belief that training as an event is a waste of time. And in, in my opinion, dead and <laughs> learning as a process or a system is what the future, that's what competitive advantage looks like from a people develop, development perspective for companies. So, yeah. And, and that, that is the difference between an expense, right, a, a, an income statement line item and an asset where you've got a system and a process for learning that you can, you can, you can buy yeah. another piece of content, right, drop it in and like it still works, that whole process of learning. And, and it's also like to go back to what we were talking about earlier in that it's not rocket science, it's getting people to consume content, but then also do something differently with it, reflect on it share with others, teach each other, right? That, that, those are the components yeah. of that, of that asset. Um, and so I think for me, like the biggest takeaway for anybody listening is to think about how can you create that asset? How can you create a system, a habit, a routine for learning? Yeah. And I, I mean, I wish, um, and it is not to, uh, challenge you, Andrew. I mean, I wish, I wish your words come true about the training event stuff disappearing. Yeah. However, the reality is it, it's not going to, I mean, the, the training is always going to be some sort of, in, you know, disruptive uh, element in, in the thing because people, uh, but, but to your point, if we can reduce and minimize that, yeah. we may not eliminate it, but here's how we can do it. Right. We've asking for technology and you want to talk, create a system and element and asset that you said, mm. which I agree with you hundred percent. Mm. That is the way to go. And here's how you can do it. Right. You want all this technology, uh, e-learning technology, whatever it is, you want the LMS, you want the software, you want uh, the course development. Okay, great. Now what, what's the biggest mistake a lot of practitioners, well, not a lot, I should be generalizing like that, but what some practitioners make is that mm -hmm. they'll take the instructor like course and then replicate on e-learning. And mm -hmm. basically it's the instructor like course on e-learning. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's like, okay, there's a two day or one day course, but now it's one day or two days on a computer. Okay. Right. So the only thing you say for the company is that you didn't move the person that yeah. can sit before the computer. Mm -hmm. That's not e-learning. Mm -hmm. This is what you're learning, going back to your asset example or systems example, mm. and minimize disruption or maybe eliminate the event, try to eliminate the event altogether. Mm. The technology allows you, as I mentioned, to target. There's there metrics there in your technology to allow to target learning like I did with Apple. Um, mm. But so I, you can, and, and the technology allows us to do learning in real time. Mm. Right. I mean, nowadays we have technology and it's not going to, it's going to get even better as the years go by to allow to do learning in real time. So I always say, if you can create learning, uh, a learning experience, an asset, as you mentioned, or a system, mm. a learning experience that is real time targeted and accessible when they need it, where they need it and how they need it. Mm. Now, what you've done here is you've 
capitalize that investment, that technology investment, number one. Number two, you minimize the disruptions in the company because when do I need learning? Look at us. I mean, I, I know Mark mentioned in the podcast, you know, look at people who go to YouTube and how they made it successful. And mm. I, I resonate with me because I do that all the time. When I build yeah. something, the first thing I do is I go to you, find a YouTube channel that's like yeah. five minutes, yeah. get it learned and do it. Mm -hmm when I need it, where I need it, how I need it, and I'm done and it's applied. Mm. Well, why can't we do that in corporations? Like if I'm sitting here struggling working on an Excel spreadsheet or I'm trying to solve a custom problem, mm. why can't I just pause for a second and just say, okay, I, uh, here's the, the asset library and mm. I'm going to go in and get that learning within a minute and yeah. then now I can apply it. And if, because if it's successful with the customer or with the whatever I'm solving, I'm going to make it a habit mm -hmm. because it's re I'm being rewarded with an endorphin, right? <laughs> that it succeeded. 100%. Oh, this has worked. And, and let's, let's do more of it. 100%. Like, and so to your point, you, you, you need to make a system or an asset, but you need to, you need to really dump the old way of looking at training and learning. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and if you're going to beg for the money for uh, technology, you better use it the way they think you're going to use it for. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you're, if you, number one, if you do that, not only are you capitalizing the investment that you asked for and that you'll, you'll look good with the stakeholders, because like you said, they're monetizing that asset on the balance sheet and adding value to the company. Mm -hmm. You're also using the technology to minimize interruptions in the workflow. Uh, you're going to always have interruptions. That's why I was sort of saying to you, uh, I wish your statement is true. Mm. Uh, fully that we mm. can eliminate, but we can't. There's always going to be some interruptions, but what we can do is minimize the interruptions. Yeah, and allow yeah. you and I as learners control when we need the learning. Yeah, that's that's the thing. I say minimize and um, and uh, capitalize, I guess, on, but sort of let, like get the most out of those things yeah. because it's it's in all that other activity of doing the thing, reflecting on it, talking to others with it. That's where you get the most benefit out of, out of and, it. And think about it at this point, it's like marketing, right? In the old days, we used to push products on people and hope they buy it. Yeah. Right? And we just push, 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 push and hope somebody buys it. Mm -hmm. But successful marketers pull, right? They, yeah. they make it appealing to you. So why aren't we doing that with learning? Mm -hmm. Like, why are we trying to shove training down people's throat? Why don't we flip the script and say, hey, you pull what you need. Mm -hmm. You tell us what you need and you pull it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. because if you pull it, you're bought into it, right? Yeah. I speak about this in my LinkedIn learning course, getting buy-in for from internal this, internal stakeholders. Mm. When you get employees to pull learning, mm. they're going to, once they pull a few, that is, and you better make it good because you only get, you know, the old saying, you make, uh, you only get w one chance to make a first impression. Mm -hmm. You better make your learning appealing and good and relevant so that they say, wow, okay, it worked for me. I'm going to go back to this because it's a resource I can use yeah. and it's helping me look better, right? You have to reward the human instinct. Mm. Um, and we all want to look good. We all want to be smarter. We want to be good looking and handsome like you, Andrew, uh, <laughs> you know, um, and smart, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and you want to reward that. And yeah. when you do that, you get people to pull it. But anyways, I'm digressing. I apologize. Andrew. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, you could talk, we can, we could go down a lot of different rabbit holes here. I, I think yeah. um, to me that there's, um, there's, there's a good sort of a summary point here of kind of controlling the controllables and understanding what the business need is and make, and aligning your efforts with that. Um, I, I wonder if you've got any sort of final thoughts around that for folks who, who are, who are struggling with this, like how, how should they go about measuring the, yeah. Yeah. So the, the easiest, so here's the deal, right? I speak of, you know, when I speak about companies, I bring up all these famous names and, and, they're, and the reason they're so successful, to be honest with you, they're, again, they're not perfect, but the reason they're so successful, whomever you name, whether it be Apple or Starbucks or Toyota, um, they're successful for a reason because they're, they're, they're firing on all cylinders mm -hmm. and, 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 and for learning's purposes, learning is not an afterthought. So these people are fully integrated, invested, but that's not the reality for a lot of companies, right? So. You, if you're in a company right now and you're not sure where to start and you're a little lost and nobody's giving you any type of guidance, well, take some control. Take it. Take control here. Mm. Number one is, does your company have a mission statement? And they say, you know, chances are they do. And well, why do you want, want the mission statement? Well, because the mission statement, just like in the military, is the ultimate goal for the organization. Mm. Okay. So in the, if it's well-crafted, the mission statement is going to state their objectives of what they want to do as a company. Okay. And if I dissect the mission statement, I can find the, the key areas of the organization that's important to the organization. Now I can um, 
granularize mm -hmm. that mission statement. Okay, take one part of it. You know, uh, we want to, uh, McDonald's wanted, uh, they had a mission statement. We wanted to have uh, have people leaving with a smile. Mm -hmm. Their old mission statement had that in there. Okay, well, what does smile mean? Who's responsible for smiling in this company? Mm -hmm. How do we make smiling some? So now I, I dissect what smiling means. Smiling mm -hmm. means, you know, quick service, uh, courteous um Frontline workers. Mm -hmm. Let's just work with those two. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm going to go to the, the who's who's developing the who's the people hiring the the, the frontline workers, mm -hmm. and who's responsible for the, the quick service process. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that's operations. Okay, now get into operations. Okay, a quick service process. You know, how do we make it quicker? Mm -hmm. Is it a pro? Is it equipment or is it people? Mm -hmm. If it's people, now I get. So here yeah, I go. Yeah. I'm dissecting it, and I'm down to now the operations where if I help them make the service quicker through their people, you know, mm -hmm. training them and whatever it may be that's going to make um, the customer ultimately happier, mm -hmm. right? And so if you're worried where to start, you have an answer in front of you. Mm -hmm. It's just your refusal to look at it mm -hmm. and study it. And what, what bothers me the most is I meet, and this is, uh, this is anecdotal, by the way, but I meet one learning practitioner after another, and they tend to, not two things, they tend to like to lay blame on people not telling them what it is. And I'm like, you need to find an initiative and find it out. Mm. And second, they, um, and I hate to say this, I'll be direct about it, but they tend to, um, I guess, have a refusal to learn, mm. which sounds like an oxymoron because you're a learning practitioner. You're expecting your participants to learn something new, mm. but you become resistant to something outside of learning to learn. Mm. But it's your responsibility to be open-minded because learning happens in the spaces that you don't know. Mm. So why aren't you out there learning what's going on in your organization rather than sitting and waiting for people to come to you? Mm. And if, if you didn't want to go to a mission, that's fine. The next easy thing, like I said before, get out of your office, mm. get out of your cubicle, go talk to the people who are the profit centers or mm. the operation centers, the ones actually making the business run and say, hey, I'm here. I'm going to help you find your... Because they don't know where they don't know what they don't know, mm. and your role is to find out, find that out, and yeah. help them better. That, so. that, that echoes a previous episode we did with Christopher Lind. Um, one of the big things he said was how he goes and, and talks to people in business. So I think that's a that's a, a really great place to stop um, this conversation for this this um, part one. Let's say <laughs> I think we we've got more to come back to. Um, but that, that's like, uh, to me, like the answers are in front of you and, and such good advice there. Look at the mission statement of the company and go and talk to the people in the company. Um, so it was brilliant stuff there, AJ. Um, thank you so much for, for spending time with us today. You've got a lot of cool things going on in your business. What do you want to point folks towards? Um, well, I am, uh, I've launched, what's it, soft launch. I've soft launched a, um, a brand of our company called uh, Learn Online, it's, uh, and it's spelled L-R-N mm -hmm. online. Um, the site is not fully up yet at this point, but uh, we've, we're, what we're creating is um, e-learning courses that we provide to organizations free of charge. Yes, I said free of charge. Mm -hmm. um, and we turn, it's mostly a lot of uh, um, organizations are reselling it or nonprofits. Mm -hmm. And what they what we do is that um, in return, we're building these courses and, um, you know, we share in the revenue with them, of course, mm -hmm. but they don't incur any risk. And so we're developing that business model. Um, still doing a lot of work with LinkedIn Learning. And so if people want to find me and, and get some, some of the stuff we talked about here, I have courses on LinkedIn Learning mm. that speak to this. Mm -hmm. um, as well, we're uh, uh, in partnership with elearningindustry.com, mm -hmm. uh, developing those courses as well as I just mentioned earlier. But also I write, I'm a pr prolific writer with them. I've been writing with them for five years. Mm -hmm. I have like 70 or 80 articles on there. Um, um, I try to push the boundaries and limits. I don't expect people to agree with me 100%, mm -hmm. but I hope they don't agree with me because then we can have an intelligent conversation mm -hmm. and, and come to a conclusion. Um, so I'm yeah doing a lot of things and um, just trying to have fun, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it definitely looks I like... Will be speaking, I'll be speaking at a couple of conferences coming up too. So awesome. um, I'll be speaking at the, there's a, the chief learning, they're doing a chief learning officer... Um, Senior C level and chief learning officer conference for learning solutions or the e learning guild mm -hmm. coming up in July. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll be speaking at uh, the training industry conference coming up in June um, and a few others. So, nice. yes, yeah, you can. 
Yeah. But, uh, we'll, follow me on Twitter. Please follow me on Twitter. Yeah, so I, yeah. We, we'll put all these links in in the in the show notes. Um, yeah, lots of lots of great stuff out there to to keep up with all your work. Ajay, thanks uh, so much for your time. It was a great conversation. Andrew, it was great fun. Uh, you made it fun, and I really enjoyed being here. And I I, I hope I didn't uh, discourage you from having me back one day. No, we're definitely going to part two. <laughs> Take care. Thanks, Take everybody. Care. Hello, hello. I hope you enjoyed that episode. It's Andrew again with a quick message. If you'd like to support the show, the best way to do that is to leave us ratings and reviews where you listened. If you're on YouTube, hit the like and subscribe buttons and feel free to leave a comment. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, please take the time to give us a rating and leave a review. Once again, we love hearing from our loyal listeners. If you're listening to this on Spotify, please hit the follow button to make sure that you don't miss new episodes as they come out. And as a reminder, this episode is sponsored by the Learning Culture Experience, a first of its kind cohort-based learning experience for learning professionals in which you will join a community of 50 other innovative learning professionals designing and developing cohort learning experiences that you can roll out in your companies. To find out more about the program and when the next cohort is starting, check out curiouslion.cloud forward slash experience. See you next week for another episode of the Learning Culture Podcast. Thank you for listening.